Alderman Kennedy, Alderman Boyd, present. Alderman Davis, Alderman Kotar, Alderman Ogilvy, here. Alderman Boyd, present. Alderman Bosley, Alderman Oldenburg, here. Chairman Rohde, present. Five present. You have a quorum. Uh, before we get into today's. Uh, only order of business, which is the uh, block grant um, bill. Uh, just give you a little prelude of what we're expecting. This is our first meeting since we've come back from the summer. Uh, I've been kind of dragging my heels a little bit before we went down. Our our hope was was to have a uh, our resolution regarding incentive reform completed, and uh, we are still very diligently working on that. I shouldn't say we actually. It's uh, Jonathan Ferry is working on it as well as our our new. Um, Financial analyst. Is he back here? Gerard. Gerard, why don't you stand up? I think everybody knows. Uh, we have a new financial analyst at the board, Gerard Hollins, and uh, who uh, brings a great skill set, has uh, lots of experience, and um, has a, uh, a much more of a national view than uh, certainly I do, and probably anyone else in the city that I'm aware of. He's worked in a number of different markets in real estate and uh, is uh, very accomplished in his own right. I think he's going to be an incredible addition, not only for the Board of Aldermen, but for the city. Gerard, we're very grateful to have you on board and looking forward to working with you. Uh, Gerard and Jonathan have been coordinating on this. And um, the uh, sticking point uh, in it uh, is trying to go ahead and provide as much uh, definition so there's uh, as little uh, ambiguity about uh, what the what what incentives can be used on which projects and where and we think uh, that the title we make that the the uh, uh, better our ability to defend it uh, at least on an interim basis so uh, that's what's taking us some time our hope is is that we'll we might very well have a meeting next Wednesday if we we get it to the point where we think it's ready uh, Gerard, I'm sorry, I did not attend the neighborhood development meeting. Did they present that resolution at the neighborhood development meeting? It wasn't supposed to. Okay. Wasn't so we have consulted. We wanted to go ahead and be as inclusive as possible since the neighborhood development committee uh, hears uh, tax abatement bills. We wanted to uh, uh, at least provide them uh, an opportunity to understand what was going on. And uh, I've asked our clerk or, or uh, attorney to, to review the process and he has advised us that from a standpoint of setting president it would probably not be appropriate for them to pass the resolution or adopt it since it's before our committee but uh, there was certainly nothing wrong with at least sharing that with them so that's happened I haven't gotten a down you know I haven't gotten the uh, 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 feedback from how that went so that was just yesterday and I was out of town so I couldn't, uh, couldn't attend so we're working on that. We have a meeting scheduled for the 18th of October, uh, two weeks from today. And the intent is, is is that we would go ahead, go through the block grant bill today. Uh, invariably, there'll be some questions. There always are. And that will give us a couple weeks to provide the staff to get back any answers that they may have and, and get everyone comfortable with it. We don't like to go ahead and have bills rush through here, but uh, the goal would be is to have it passed out of our committee on the 18th because we are subject to some guidelines and um, we wanted to at least provide some opportunity for feedback, but it's important that we do come to a schedule. Uh, also on the 18th, we will have some uh, bills regarding zoning that we've been uh, um, kind of waiting on. So those will be coming through and then um, sometime in November, uh, our, we're going to continue our work on incentive, ref, uh, excuse me, on uh, <clears throat> performance measurement. And uh, the alderman from the 16th ward has graciously agreed to kind of uh, step up and help us with that. So he's been meeting with uh, the budget division, comptroller's office, folks at SLDC, and um, you know, collecting this information from a, a variety of different uh, city departments uh, and offices. So uh, we hope to have a bit of an update on that. And uh, then uh, sometime 
after the 18th, assuming that we get the uh, incentive reform passed by then, we'll be having some hearings on a number of the development bills that we've been holding, hoping to get this resolution adopted prior to having those hearings. So that gives you a little prelude. After we get the incentive reform resolution and then we get through all the bills that we have to hear, the performance measures will be uh, back in front and center. And then we have bills uh, regarding uh, community benefit agreements, and we will probably start on that late this year or early next year. So it's not that we're trying to stop things. It's just that, uh, you know, we have a lot of work to do, and we're trying to put it in the appropriate order. So with that, um, I guess I'm the sponsor on this, but I'm going to turn it over to our executive director, our acting executive director. Uh, uh, Al I, Alana will be informal. Alana Green. Alana. Thank you, Chairman Rohde and members of the committee. Um, we provided a pretty thick packet for today's meeting, but basically it's a lot of documents that the committee generally requests um, from us at each meeting, so we went ahead and prepared those um, for the first meeting so you had them and enough time to look at them between now and the next meeting. Um, I have several staff people here with me who will be presenting on various um, topics under our presentation, um, and they will introduce themselves when they come up. Um, and just so you know, in your packet, um, we have our presentation for today, um, a copy of the board billing exhibit. Um, we included a, two analyses of the prior year's funding so you know what um, organizations received in the past and how their spending um, was in their prior grants. We also have a summary of the competitive proposals that were provided by each organization. So if you want to know um, basically what they plan to do with the funding, you have a, a, a spreadsheet that details that specifically. We have also um, a 2014 to 2017 activity allocation by fund and ward. That's something we had provided previously, and we're more than happy to provide that again this year. You then have information on um, what's our housing notice of funding availability process, minor home repair, and healthy home repair, and maps as well. So getting into um, just discussion points, Today we'll talk about um, just an overview of the HUD required changes. We'll review the 2017 funding process, a summary of the new programs that are recommended, and then an overview of home repair and minor home repair. So it was about five years ago when HUD came in and said um, things need to change. And so we jumped on that and many of you were involved in that process. Um, but it basically changed a system that was in place for over 20 years. <coughs> Excuse me. And HUD provided technical assistance during that process to us. And basically the reason for the change was to ensure that HUD allocations and the management of the money was done as, um, as um, objective as possible and with maximum community housing impact and benefit. So just um, an overview of what HUD basically told us during this time. They said that if these changes were not made, the city would be at risk. Um, and that would require repayment of CDBG and home funds expended in prior program years. And that repayment would have to come from a non-federal source. And so the, I'm sorry, I'm on page four, if you're looking for what slide I'm on. And so the role of the consultants were to facilitate the city's political leaders in moving towards compliance, assisting CDA with revamping its request for a proposal, and completing a market value analysis. And some of the recommended changes they asked us to put in place would be, <clears throat> excuse me, to detail specific activities that weren't required to compete for funding, and that was generally government and quasi-government, meaning SLDC. Utilize the scoring matrix and completeness review process when reviewing funding proposals, and utilizing an application process to award contracts. <clears throat> so once HUD left, they kind of told us, go ahead and make additional changes to make sure your program is effective. So a few things that we did um, to make the process a little bit easier for our applicants, we created a frequently asked questions process so during the application process they would be able to answer, ask questions and we would answer them in an objective way. We created a separate and distinct email address for all applicants and that's cdbg at stlewis-mo.gov. We enhanced the use of the CDA website where we include all of this information now on our website. We instituted capacity building workshops, which basically help organizations that are currently funded and, and wanting to be funded 
learn how to manage CDBG programs. <clears throat> and what we find is organizations that participate in those capacity building sessions actually do better in the rating process. Um, we instituted an online grants management system. It was pretty burdensome for organizations to come down with five packets of two or 300 pages. So now they can institute and put that all online instead of submitting it in person. We enhance our citizen participation process as well. Um, we issue annual priorities not only to the Board of Aldermen, but also we have a special public, public meeting for residents to um, chime in on the priorities. We enhance our social media presence. We use Facebook, Twitter, and we've instituted the housing NOFA process. And we've also completed a consolidated planning process <coughs> that included the most citizen participation in over 20 years. So in reviewing the 2018 funding process, one of our first goals in the process is to estimate what our funding would be for 2018 and what we, <coughs> excuse me, what we realized is that, again, we will most likely have a cut. Um, and if you look on page 11, there is a chart which shows the decline in CDBG funding over the years. And <clears throat> we're no longer receiving close to 30 million. We're receiving almost half of that, so about 16 million that we estimate. If you look at the next slide, we have home funding. There was a huge cut in 2012, about 50% home and so we're working with about two million dollars each year for home. If you look at the, the timeline from when we issued the RFP till now it's about two months two or three months. <clears throat> so starting in June we submitted draft priorities to the Board of Aldermen and we also issued priorities to the community. One thing new this year is instead of having one public meeting to address priorities, we had three within the community. So we had one at O'Fallon Recplex, one at Carondelet Recplex, and one at CDA. We had several capacity building workshops during this time. <clears throat> and then also on July 10th, we issued the RFP. We had grants management system training. And the proposals were due on August 11th. And then on September 19th, we posted the recommendations on the CDA website. So I actually called Paul Warner up, who works with the monitors and who handles um, doing contracts for the organizations recommended. Morning. Um, I'm going to pick up on page 16 if you're not there, and kind of uh, as long as I said, my name is Paul, um, but I'm going to pick up on page 16 and give you guys a quick highlight of some of the agencies we funded. The full list is farther back on page 41. So uh, the first one I'm going to talk about is the, the 22nd Judicial Circuit Family Court, or also the Innovative Concept Academy. That was founded by Judge Jimmy Edwards, and is a partnership of the St. Louis Public Schools, MERS Goodwill, and the Family Courts. Um, and Innovative provides a safe school environment to youth who are suspended or have a safe schools violation, as well as summer school and after school programs. Innovative strives to build youth resiliency and teach positive social li and life skills to at-risk youth. Uh, Better Family Life, led by Better Family Life's James Clark, the Neighborhood Alliance Program, provides door-to-door -door violence prevention outreach and neighborhood-based case management to households living in high-crime neighborhoods in North St. Louis. The program identifies families in need and works with partner organizations to assist households with education, GEDs, jobs, health and mental health services, food, housing, mentoring, um, as well as providing gun violence de-escalation services. City Seniors is located in the Bevo neighborhood and it provides services to senior citizens and disabled adults to help them to enable them to remain healthy and independent. City Seniors provides comprehensive services including case management, home delivered meals, congregate meals, uh, health and wellness screenings, nutrition resources, fitness and recreation and transportation assistance. Uh, CHIPS or community health and community health and partnership services or CHIPS. Uh, the CHIPS Health and Wellness Center was founded by Herb and Judy Bentley. Um, it's located on North Grand. It's a nurse-managed free clinic that provides primary health care and mental health care services to low-income individuals who are underinsured and underserved. Um, the center also provides dental services, chiropractic services, and chronic disease support groups. Uh, the CHIPS Healthcare Beyond Walls program that provides free health screenings um, in the community to share health and wellness information with people who 
primarily who don't see a doctor on a regular basis. Uh, screenings take, take place at libraries, churches, food pantries, businesses, um, and other community events. And primarily they, they identify low-income, uninsured individuals that don't have access to health care and would otherwise miss opportunities for early diagnosis and treatment of disease. Um, expanded recreation, the Department of Parks, Recreation, Forestry's expanded recreation program provides summer day camp instructional recreational swimming and sports leagues at nine locations throughout the city. Uh, the expanded recreation program focuses on providing a safe, healthy environment for youth in the city of St. Louis. Food outreach, next one. Food outreach provides service to severely low-income individual, individuals with HIV, AIDS, and cancer. CDBG funding supports healthy, scratch-prepared frozen meals, groceries, and shelf-stable food items, uh, plus individualized dietetic counseling, which is provided at no cost. Uh, Herbert Hoover Boys and Girls Club of St. Louis provides structured, high-quality youth development programs, uh, including programs in mentoring, education, health and life skills, recreation, fitness, and leadership development, job training, and career exploration to low to moderate income youth in the city of St. Louis. Um, the Boys and, Girls, Boys and Girls Club of St. Louis, their after school programs serve approximately 2,700 youth annually at three different locations. The MERS and the STL Youth Jobs Program provides a summer employment program for at-risk youth to increase academic success, develop workplace skills, and reduce behaviors which correlate to youth violence and criminal activity. Uh, low to moderate income youth receive eight weeks paid employment an individualized career assessment, financial literacy and job readiness training, access to a free and safe bank account, as well as mentoring and career support. North Newstead Association, the North Newstead Safety Initiative will implement a comprehensive set of strategies consistent with the peer plan to reduce crime in nine North St. Louis neighborhoods. Activities will include crime prevention training sessions for neighborhood residents, community meetings with residents and the police, and community service activities with formerly incarcerated individuals. Prosperity Connection will offer free financial literacy education and counseling through group classes, individualized sessions on the topics of budgeting, banking, credit, predatory lending, and identity theft. Uh, Prosperity Connection will partner with social service agencies to hold sessions throughout the city and reach a larger clientele, including unemployed workers, the formerly incarcerated, survivors of domestic violence, the homeless, single parents, immigrants, and refugees, and future entrepreneurs. Riverview West Florissant Development Corporation, uh, the Baden's, Baden Enrichment STEM Center, provides after school and summer programming for youth ages 5 to 18. The center serves youth living in Baden and the surrounding neighborhoods and works to identify, or I'm sorry, works with youth to identify their individual strengths and weaknesses, expose them to opportunities unavailable in the community, and develop youth into productive, responsible, and educated adults. Uh, the St. Louis Area Agency on Aging, or SLAY, SLAY provides a comprehensive and coordinated service delivery system for the elderly of the city of St. Louis. CDBG funding assists in providing home delivered meals to over 450 low income, homebound, elderly and disabled persons in the city of St. Louis. The home delivered meal is often the only meal that the client has each day and keeps the client independent, avoiding institu institutionalization. The Tower Grove Neighborhoods, uh, CDC this year, there um, was a collaborative partnership between North Newstead Association and the Tower Grove Neighborhood CDC to educate landlords on the most effective ways to manage and maintain rental units in the city of St. Louis. Seminars will take place in North and South City and include new and expanded topics for 2018. Harambe Youth Training Corporation, Harambe's youth, youth job training programs provide teens who are primarily low income and from single parent homes with education in basic life skills, technical training, and hands-on job training in masonry and tuck pointing. In addition, low to moderate income homeowners, the majority of which are seniors, receive free tuck pointing to help stabilize their homes uh, and maintain their viability and affordability. Gene Slay's Girls and Boys Club uh, will expand their comprehensive youth development programming to a second location to serve the youth of the Dutchtown and Gravelly Park neighborhoods. The completed facility will offer comprehensive after school and summer programs to approximately 150 to 200 youth per day. The Department of Parks of Rec and Forestry Public Improvements. In 2016, CDA awarded funding um, for improvements to the Wool and 12th and Park Recreation Centers. In 2018, we've continued our support and I awarded additional $500,000 um, to assist with improvements to two additional rec centers. So with that, that's my quick overview of some of the agencies and programs. Do you have any questions or any? 
uh, why don't we go go through the uh, list to Alderman Kennedy? Is he present? He stepped out. Um, well, Alderman Boyd, you're next on the list. So sure. Um, what are the two additional recreation centers that uh, are supporting? I don't know that they've been. Uh, yeah, well, they might be able to better answer that. I think preliminarily one of them is Gamble, but they haven't identified um, the other one yet. So we're just Alec the money in anticipation that we can at least support too. Yes, and hopefully more um, depending on what the needs are um, for those centers there might be enough to fund um, stuff and others as well. Okay, and the Gene Slade Boys and Girls Club this is they've been funded in the past right? They've been funded for kind of a public service activity um, about twenty five thirty thousand dollars um, just for their center in um, Soulard but now they're looking to expand into Dutchtown and Grabway Park uh, because they have the highest concentration of youth in the city and actually set up a center there. So is this money to renovate a facility and yes. get it operational? Is it, is it mostly um, hard dollars or soft dollars? We normally do hard dollars, so okay. actual construction So it's renovations, basically. Yes. Renovations. Okay, thank you. No mm -hmm. further questions. Alderwoman Davis. Give me the explanation for Gene Slay expansion again. Um, so Dutch Town and Grabway Park have the highest concentration of youth in the city. And so they applied to expand their services. So instead of offering um, only a facility in Soulard, where a lot of the kids can't get to, they're going to offer it, um, actually have a facility inside of the Dutch Town and Grabway Park neighborhood. That's good. Okay. Um, my uh, other question very quickly is <clears throat> I noticed on here that um, Mayor's Goodwill um, with their youth and jobs program are they expanding their numbers for outreach this this year do you recall if they put that in their proposal for expansion I don't think, I think typically our our piece funds I think it's 17, it was about 60 kids were funded with our funding. Um, and I think they, they expect about 40, 45, depending on how, what the actual salaries get paid for. Okay. So I think, I mean, I think they're constantly improving, but yeah, that the piece that we've, the we, piece that we pay for is about those 40 kids. Okay. The only thing I'm gonna offer in all of this is, we have a lot of resources in our town that's free, and we're gonna have to start insisting that these partnerships become more comprehensive so that we can reach more. Um, I just believe that um, a lot of times we're, we're ignoring the expertise that's already there and we need to start doing that. That's the only thing. Okay. Thank you. Um, let's see. Alderman Ogilvie. <laughs> Thanks. Um, can I ask a question about home repair? Are you guys going to? We will talk about that in detail, but we can answer any I'll, questions. I'll, wait that, yeah. okay. I'll just wait. Um, thanks. Alderwoman Boyd. Oh. Uh, Alderman Oldenburg. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I had a quick question just flipping to page 15, which looks like your recommended breakdown in categories. Mm -hmm. Is that, are those numbers based on, and forgive me for maybe having um, a lack of sophistication with CDBG funds um, and as they come, uh, but is that based on programmatic breakdown? In other words, does so much of it have to go towards affordable housing, or is that based on demand from the applications or a little sort bit of, of your analysis and the need? A little bit of both. Okay. Um, so HUD gives us caps on two areas, one being public service, so all of the, the feel-good stuff that we get most applications on, we can't fund most of them because we have a cap there. I see. Um, and then admin is also capped, rightfully so. Um, the other ones are based on need and also based on the proposals received. Okay. So if you're receiving more sort of um, affordable housing and wraparound service activity applications, you tend to, to, to recommend those as being funded more than the others, right? We have more liberty to fund more of those because there's no cap. I understand. Yeah. That makes sense to me. Okay, okay. thank you. Uh -huh. You're welcome. Alderman Kennedy, uh, did you have any questions? 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, some of the agencies that have youth and senior services also applied for Prop Position F dollars. Oh, and I wasn't aware. Received that. I was not aware. You're not aware. Mm -mm, no. Okay, I'll be sure to share that with you. Please so we do. Know yes. Where people are coming on in double places in terms of the city. Okay. It might be helpful if Paul meets with what staff person is responsible for that to make sure right. there's no um, duplication of effort. Right. Okay. Right. And there, that's um, a person up in public safety office. Uh, okay. Rebecca okay. 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 Thanks. So I want to make sure I understand the organization that the information on page 15 mm -hmm. was what we just went through then yes. that those were all the and then we're going to talk more about housing production in, in, the, in a second okay. the million dollars for economic development activities mm -hmm. which of those that is that is LRA okay. that, would be the, the LRA that was not on this list that you just ran through that no that it? was just kind of a, a briefer of some of the agencies if you look on page starting on page 41 um, the exhibit a the board bill that would be all of the the organizations that we fund or that we're proposing to fund okay, for 2018 so that is a, on this one right here mm -hmm, starting yeah. on that yes okay. so um the so, interim assistance category would be um, on page 43. You see LRA property maintenance and vacancy support at $1,050,000. Okay. And then is the facade program funded through this then? It is funded through this on page, let me find it. Page 44, Paul says. Um, at seven hundred thousand dollars. So then that. So if I go back up to the front of this, so is that considered economic development then too, or? It it probably should be. So that's something we should probably include in that category. Okay, which category was it included in then? Um, this is just kind of a summary. Not everything is included on this sheet. Okay. <clears throat> But the actual categories themselves in the Exhibit A um, is, give, gives a better breakdown. So you'll see kind of public services, the total is at $2.9 million. Um, interim assistance is $1,050,000 for housing. Um, we have a minor home repair program. You'll see it's at $700,000 for all of the activities requesting funding under there. Home repair is at... 1.975 million for the year. Housing production, um, 3,886,000 for a total of 6.5 under housing, and that's including minor home repair. Um, let's see. Commercial district improvements, 700,000. I'm sorry. Uh, I think you're losing. I know I'm a little lost. I don't know if anybody else is. I if we could just kind of yeah. slow down and. Yeah. Okay, sure. May I, the, the confusion was the preliminary synopsis that you gave us mm -hmm. brings people to believe this is it. No, it is And not so it. it was just giving you a for example yes. for the presentation was made earlier. And now we're going to get in to each one of the specific categories of explanation of funding. Mm -hmm. And so I think that was the confusing part. You're looking for more in that preliminary than it should have been there so okay yeah, yeah. we could have a hundred pages probably of just descriptions right. of organizations right okay um, so that was just a flavor as opposed to yes. the okay yes. correct and so the for the detail we are back on page 41 is that we're going to go back to 41 now or are we going to go into housing production we can do that we can do this now it's fine or we could wait till the I end i think we should go through each one of the categories so we can have clarity okay so yep. we're now we're at housing production Okay. Housing programs. Okay. Um, is that a, called Jay yeah. that, So we're going to go get an overview of housing production before we go into the detail. Is that what you're asking? I think we have it broken up now. This is what you're looking for now. We're about to get to what you're looking for. So each one of these sections now will give you specifics of the categories of funding. Mm -hmm. Whereas before it was a synopsis 
of these are the types of things we're doing to give you a flavor. Okay, well, okay. so housing production though, where, where does that start at back here? Um, in the, the presentation, we're gonna go back to the presentation okay. here, it's on page. Housing program starts on page 25. Okay, so we'll go back here and then we, we'll go through this and then we'll go into yes. the detail. Yep. Okay. that works. I'm gonna actually call Jason up. We have a, a Another question yes. here. Alana, I'm, I'm going to make sure I'm clear. So on page 15, the 1,050,000 it says in economic development activities, that actually lines up with the facade program. Okay. Okay. Right. But Alana, because she threw me off, she said it was LRA. Okay. But LRA is public service. Um, it's interim assistance, but the, the dollar amount threw me what off. So. What category is um, LRE? Interim assistance. That's the that's the HUD category. That is a HUD that. category? Mm -hmm. is, is, is that a cap on that? Category? There is no cap on that. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. I'm good. Okay. I'm going to call Jason up. Jason's actually our new um, housing development manager, and he'll give you a presentation. It, just that we have another question here. Go, go ahead, Alder. <laughs> Ahead, Elena, because I'm kind of confused. Okay, sure. So Jeffrey was asking, what was the HUD account? What was that? There's no cap where um, LRA is sitting as far as the category. There's no cap there. So it's um, LRA is titled interim assistance, mm -hmm. meaning that eventually um, there will be redevelopment on the properties that they they hold. So that's the HUD category that it fits under. We're helping in the interim. Okay. What I see so some of the categories have limits on so if the block grant has x number of dollars they will only permit x percent of that dollar value to go into that category okay and some, so some of the categories have limits yeah like, so uh, public cities. service and oh. and admin have caps that okay. we can't exceed and so usually our proposals that we get in come from public service and we can't fund everything because of that cap okay okay mm -hmm. that's Okay. So as an example, any administration and overhead would be, so like the staff at CDA is capped at how much they can spend on their staff and anything that might be substituting what the city should normally be doing, uh -huh. that would be considered city services. And combined that is what, 19 or 21 yes, percent or something like that? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, you know, out of our total block grant of... 60 a rock 16 million we can spend mm -hmm. no more than about 3.2 million mm -hmm. on staff okay. and mm -hmm. services that might otherwise be provided by the city so that means that we have to spend the remaining approximately 13 million on, the service. on on things other than those two categories and so the facade falls under that there's no cap it doesn't fall under a cap okay yes so it does okay nope, it does. so they have the dollars there Yes, they have. Facade. Okay. Right, for facade. Right. 700000 we're proposing for 2018. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. I'm going to call Jason up. Good morning. Uh, as Alana said, my name is Jason Hensley. I'm the new residential development manager. Um, if I sound a little nervous, I can assure you that I absolutely am. <laughs> um, <laughs> we don't okay. bite today. The, uh, <laughs> Uh, I'd like to go over the housing production uh, that we have at, at CDA. Um, in 2014, as Alana mentioned, HUD asked us to make some changes, and we um, did a NOFA process, uh, the Notice of Funding Availability, where we list um, projects uh, or, or property addresses that CDA controls, uh, and we also have um, uh, in, in asking developers to come to us and say, you know, we have identified a need here. We'd like to do this this uh, building here. Then we uh, rate the the projects and then um, award funding. Um, the process uh, is is more equitable in that um, there it's a competitive process. The developers are coming to us. They're presenting their their proposals. They're um, giving us their numbers, uh, and we're reviewing those. Um, so we're looking for competency, we're looking for capacity. Um, so the process is uh, competitive, transparent. Um, we use the market value analysis that HUD provided in 2014, which gives us an overview um, on a map of what um, uh, property values, uh, home ownership, um, you know, metrics like that, 
uh, shows us where uh, we can make the most impact. Uh, and so we uh, rate the projects uh, based on that. Um, so that leads into prioritizing CDA funds. Uh, you know, we're building upon strength areas. Uh, we're concentrating our investment strategy. Uh, we reward developers who propose projects in later NOFAs where investment has already been made by CDA. So if we have funded a project, um, say, on uh, Cates Avenue, uh, and a developer proposes another development a block away, that's within the same block group, and so we uh, give them more points for that because we want to build upon that strength. Um, so as far as housing production goes, we do have one NOFA at least a year. Uh, we hold pre-application workshops where we invite people to come and uh, learn about the process. Uh, it is a test. Uh, the um, application that we have, the spreadsheet that we have, what we require from developers, uh, we expect a high level of skill from the people who um, come to us and, and request our gap financing. Um, we provide technical assistance. Uh, we uh, have added to our website the frequently asked questions, so we update that for every uh, NOFA round. So uh, it just keeps building and building. Um, every question is answered and every question is posted so that it is, um, everyone has the same information and um, uh, everyone's on the same playing field. Um, so finally, our production accomplishments since 2014, we've had six NOFAs since then. Uh, we've uh, provided 19 million in CDBG home and NSP uh, money awarded. Uh, we have uh, funded 66 development projects, 806 units, 301 new construction, 505 rehabilitation, and we have leveraged $179 million in total development. Um, so that is the end of my slides, and I'll ask for questions. <laughs> Uh, any questions on housing production eligibility? So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, of the 66 uh, awarded development projects, how many of those were in North St. Louis or affect minority or poor communities? Alderman Kennedy, I can't answer that off the top of my head. I apologize, but I'll be happy to. But can you get that for us? I will absolutely get that for you. Alderman, we have been working on getting a uh, uh, comprehensive analysis of how much affordable housing has been created in St. Louis by wards, and we're trying to do that across programs so that that would include uh, block grant money, public housing, the affordable housing trust fund, and LIPAC, and um, we had almost had that completed. Um, before we went down, and is it Finally, complete. We they had just a, uh, you know, it was very close to being done. Because we're short staffed right now in the housing section, he hasn't worked on it completely to the point where it's finished, but um, very close. Okay, the idea would be, Alderman, that uh, that we would have that, you know, documentation of uh, where we sit at any particular point in time, and then each year we would then update that so that we can see how we're doing, you know, how we're, how we're doing, whether or not we're, we're growing or, or, you know, meeting the needs and so forth. So um, my, th that was one of the performance measures that we started working on, and we would hope to have that real soon, and perhaps we can have them come back and actually get an overview of that. And I think they have some interim numbers that they can probably share with you now what's been done historically, the 1840 has done quite well, incidentally, I think you're in the top, I think it might be second in the city all the way, so I'll have to be happy about it, so. Um, but we'll, oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. Um, I also want to mention on page 67 of your packet, we have the um, activity allocations by fund and ward. So you will see for the last um, two and a half, three years, um, the distribution by ward. Um, and then we also took the liberty of making it, putting it north, south, and central. Um, and a lot of the funding um, that you see under CDBG and home and led would be kind of housing related activities, either 
home that's repair. On, what page is that? 67. Seven. So it would include a lot of housing. Yes. So it would include housing production, home repair, right. things as such. I'm sorry. How? Oh, here it is. Now the pages go over here to the I see it. Look on the, the bottom right, it'll say HUD's presentation with the page number. And some of the attachments in there are labeled too, but. So this would be by ward. That's for the last three years, including two and a half, three years. Yeah, would that include this year? The um, most recent up one? until I think July thirty first of this year. Um, does it sound, do you want still more detail, or, or I still have some other? Oh, questions. sure. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the changes that were made, were, was that 2013? It started in 2013 um, right. for 2014. Mm -hmm. And I know you outline, outlined why the changes were made with her. I, I just want to say a few things in relationship to that. Sure. You know, some time ago, a group of citizens actually filed a complaint with her from the city of St. Louis oh, okay. about how dollars were being spent, how uh, the CBD funds were being spent in the city of St. Louis. Okay. And they were from North St. Louis. And their complaint was, was that they were feeling that monies were not being equitably spent. Now, equitably means not just equal, right. but where the greatest need was, the monies were not going. Okay. Now, Alderman had inserted themselves in the process. Well, let me go back a little bit. From my understanding, early on when it was happening, mm -hmm. uh, it, it appeared as if these monies were primarily going in some areas of, I'm talking about when the early days of it starting in downtown in the central, what was ultimately to develop as a central West End, which, which was not a term used for that area at the time. Right. And not, and though those areas qualified, they were not the areas of the greatest need. And so these citizens complained about that. Mm -hmm. What we did as, as all the people, and particularly as, as African-American aldermen, is try to insert ourselves as much as in that, in that process to ensure that dollars came into to our areas or the areas of the greatest need. That ultimately, that complaint ultimately led to a congressional hearing that was held right here in this room okay. that Congressman Clay organized. They were looking specifically at how the city was spending those uh, funds and the whole thing called the Team 4 plan. And that hearing was held. You can get the transcripts of that hearing. That led to HUD ultimately saying some changes need to be made. But for us as African-American aldermen, our concern will be, will these changes bring the equitable distribution of these dollars that we were, that caused us to insert ourselves in the first place? So with that backdrop, I'd like to know that information. Has this really met the intent of what the change was supposed to be? What it was attempting to accomplish? Or or has the change just continued the status quo? Mm -hmm. And that's what the, we need that information. Right. Okay. Right. And certainly I would think, based upon that, we would need to give some report back to Hood, whether or not, and that congressional committee, as to whether or not this is meeting the goal. Right. I hope I was not confusing in my no, attempt not. to you reconstruct not. history. You were not. Okay. Um, that's one of the reasons why we have a lot of training opportunities because right. we do feel that um, without those, um, we will be leaving people right. behind who might not be able to know how to complete the application, who might not right. have, um, you know, staff. So we right. have several trainings throughout the year, maybe about ten to twelve a year, just for that purpose. Right. We want to make sure that um, it's not just the the organizations that have been around for forever. Mm -hmm. um, having the opportunity to apply for our funding. But I also wanted to clarify a, a point, not, at least make a point that, you know, there, there was this kind of notion that the elected officials being as closely involved as they were with something uh, incorrect or putting more politics in it. But 
I know as African American aldermen, we pushed to insert ourselves in the process because monies were not coming to our area, yet our areas were the ones of the greatest need and generated the dollars that were coming to the city from the block grant funds. So to make sure that there was some equity, we, we inserted ourselves as much as we could to make sure that it was directed in, in that way. Okay. Not to disenfranchise anybody else, mm -hmm. but our areas were the hardest hit right. in terms of poverty and, and disinvestment and the rest of that. Okay. Great. So. Um, but yeah, right. we can definitely get you the um, housing production numbers um, from the last several years right. um, by word. Yeah, mm -hmm. and uh, let me just interject to uh, Alderman Kennedy. Uh, the the money for housing production has gone down significantly. I mean, we have about two million dollars a year. We try to le leverage that as much as possible. Um, I will point out a couple of projects that that just pop off the top of my head: uh, uh, North Sarah, um, St. Ferdinand Homes Two, which we just closed on, mm -hmm. um, and um, uh, there's the uh, West End Apartments on uh, Cabinet. Um, that are going to produce hundreds of units that we've leveraged uh, those funds, and um, those are I, I think those are three really great projects. And the the cabinet project, um, 5882, um, will produce 30 uh, units of, of low income housing, um, low income rental housing, and the 50 to 60 percent AMI. Um, so we are we are doing as much as we can with the limited funds that we have, uh, but we'll absolutely get that information for you. I would appreciate it. And, and also realize that the North Sarah was greatly able to happen because of stimulus dollars. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. No, and it was, then it, block grant help it, it, further. It, um, it, it, it wasn't like block grant caused it to happen. The stimulus oh, no, dollars no, 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 no. made available. Absolutely, yeah. And, and, and the, the advantage that North Sarah had was that it was shovel ready at the time of Correct. the stimulus. And so they were able to basically right. just right. leap out of the gate you know, ahead of everybody else. So, uh, but we, you know, it, it's still the, the money that we have to put into those projects are not going to make them happen. Um, but they will, uh, it, we, that's why we call it gap financing. They, it will uh, sort of push them over the, the, the hump so that they can get all of their numbers to work. Right. And we, some years ahead of that, between the 18th and 19th, somewhere around 2000, had created a plan for that those two communities, the Vanderbilt neighborhood and Covenant Blue. Mm -hmm. And so by the time these other dollars became available, we had a shovel ready uh, uh, both plan and area for that to happen in. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you would get that information, it would be greatly appreciated. Uh, and if you haven't seen the transcripts from that hearing, I would urge you to get it. I'll even send you the link to it so that you can see what came from that hearing that was held here. If you could send, I'll send you an email. I'd like to see that link. Okay, then. Thank you. On, just so I'm clear, on page 67, you said that was the activity for that four-year time period, correct? Uh, for the last two and a half years. Two and a half years. Okay. Well, I guess I'm just, I get kind of fixated with numbers, but um, it says that there's $89 million for two and a half years, but how is that when we're only, what did we say we're doing? We're doing about 16 million a year or something like that? It also includes any money that was unspent from prior years that we reallocated. Um, and then also take into account, it includes the 29.5 choice um, award. Okay, so if we pull out the 29, that, leaves, that takes us down to about 60 million. Mm -hmm. And then how much of that was... So this is housing production, which was, I thought you said that we cut housing production down to... Yeah, it's housing production. It's also our regular allocation. So any money that would have been unspent from prior years that we do substantial amendments for to reappropriate under our NOFA, that would be included there. So this is stuff, this is for projects that we allocated in 2014 to 2017. Doesn't mean the money is from the 2014 to 2017 allocation. Okay, so... How much money do we have left over from previous years then? Um, hardly any now. Um, if you can recall, um, I guess it was three years ago or two years ago, we did a substantial amendment for about $7 million that had been kind of sitting unallocated um, that HUD said, you've got to do something with or we're going to recapture it. Okay, so in a typical, in the last two and a half years, how much NOVA uh, 
allocation did we get then? From prior money, quite a bit. Um, I would say I, I can't say for certain, but it was we had maybe ten or fifteen million dollars that was unspent from prior years that we allocated. So we spent we allocated about thirty million. Or excuse me, about sixty million dollars in the last two and a half years. Is that right? And that includes um, our allocations for 2014, 15, 16, and 17 okay. from CDBG. Okay. All right. I'm sorry. I, uh, I digress here. Uh, Alderman Boyd, did you have any questions about housing production? Yeah, I have a few questions. Uh, just some simple clarity questions. Let's see. Okay. I'm on page 26. Um, as far as housing production, I want to make sure that the last sentence is an accurate statement. All areas of the city are eligible to receive NOPA awards. Is that accurate? Absolutely. Yes. And the notice of so the NOPA is housing production, right? Yeah. Well, we have a NOPA for housing production. Is are there NOPAs for well? They have for um, the list that Paul gave with uh, food outreach and all that. And so home repair is that that's part of. Uh, home repair is actually Mel's going to come up behind me and talk about home repair. But that's under the NOFA uh, as well. That's actually a separate area as well. <laughs> Sorry. For clarity, we have two funding cycles. One's considered a NOFA, notice of funding availability, and one's called an RFP, request for proposal. The request for a proposal is all non-housing production. Gotcha. So. We would okay. award uh, minor home repair and home repair. But under we're that talking RFP. housing production, yes, right? Yes. So, so stay right there, Alana, for because I want to make sure I'm clear. So, my understanding: block grant money allocations are based on census tracts, block groups, and all of that for eligibility. And Not necessarily. So, okay. um, so say for instance, someone was going to build a home for a low to moderate income person in St. Louis Hills. Okay. That would still be eligible because that home would be um, um, gotcha. obtained by someone that's low mod. So for, for many, many years, I know um, the Alder woman from the 16th prior to Alder man, Oldenburg, would always talk about how the 16th ward never was eligible for any type of black grant. So that really wasn't true. It's not true because the, um, if someone is low to mod income and they want to be um, on the, the home repair list, they are eligible. Um, okay. And we could do housing for low to mod income individuals in those areas. Okay. Okay. All right. I just want to make sure I was clear. Um, now, LRA, the, the one million fifty. I, first of all, I, I can't imagine in, in uh, St. Louis Hills they're going to build a low income house. I want to be on the record for that. I'll, do they, or maybe they do? That's all tongue in cheek, everybody. <laughs> but anyway, LRA, the million fifty. Yes. Now, is that a special allocation for you? you said it was it was interim something. So, is that the money that's to be allocated to kind of shore up some of these LRA buildings? Um, it's the the funding that we've funded them for a long time. Okay. To, Yes, just a regular allocation. Okay. Um, we are including this year a position to help them um, potentially shrink the, the bucket of vacant properties that they have. It'll be a, a vacancy support role. Okay. That'll help market That's these That's part units. of the million dollars? It is. Okay. So they actually, LRA actually took a cut just like most of our admin groups, um, but we added the funding in for specifically for that vacancy uh, position to hope that we can get some of those off of the, the city books. Okay, so the, the market evaluation analysis, if I remember correctly, HUD actually paid for all of that technical assistance and created the MBA, right? They did, yes. It's time to be updated. It is, and so they're not paying for it. <laughs> they're not? No, we, we've we been budgeting over the last five years at CDA to make sure we have enough money to, to do that again. So we will be issuing um, an RFP through the city's PSA process at some point this year, hopefully, to have that updated. What do you think it's going to cost? I cannot say. The only thing I can do is probably contact HUD and see how much they paid for it. But we didn't. We weren't privy to the amount. Out of curiosity, do you think one of the um, colleges could do this? Absolutely. One of the business business schools could actually do this. They can probably do a lot of the the legwork. I think um, the reinvestment fund is. They kind of do MBAs all over the country, and it's kind of their their process is proprietary. I'm thinking, 
So we can probably get them involved to reduce our cost, but we would still probably need to have the reinvestment fund in the mix at some point. So HUD has engaged with someone that has a proprietary product that across America we're stuck with following not, their formula? Not necessarily proprietary, but they are the expert at the market value now. They heard created that. So many great things about Gerard. I bet he can figure out how to do this MBA stuff. <laughs> Actually, we have a process oh. in place. Okay. I, I wouldn't the think Urban it's Development that Department at SLU, oh, okay. and they've hired two researchers really? uh, okay. who actually did that kind of work in Chicago, okay. and we recruited them here. So we have a lot of, that's what I'm talking about, strengths yeah. that are already here. So can and, you yeah. get me their information, and we'll definitely get them in the, the loop. And I was just offering that because I know sometimes we're just so used to doing things a certain way mm -hmm. and we don't think about the leveraging that our woman uh, Davis talks about all the time. And I was just thinking it would be a great project for one of the yeah. maybe business schools here, at, at least, you know, have the conversation. Absolutely. Anytime we can save federal money, we want to save federal money. So. And city money. And city money, correct. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, all of them, Davis? I just wanted to um, follow up a little bit on Alderman Kennedy's concerns because a lot of people, uh, most especially on the outside, uh, give you uh, responsibilities that are not yours. Um, you are a facilitator of a process for HUD uh, and they, you are not the planner for the city of St. Louis. And so that's where we're really lacking. Uh, we don't have an active process that is going out and recruiting developers and or ideas to support the improvement of these north side neighborhoods. And so in the past, that was almost a full-time job for the aldermen in those areas. I would have dreams about trying to figure out something, uh, but it, it um, somewhere along the line, we're gonna have to bring something together that supports this process happening on a more comprehensive level. And, and it's, it's really lacking, because I know if we break these numbers down, uh, we're not going to find the number of affordable units that we would like to have being developed. Uh, and when we look at our census tracts, that actually gives us the opportunity to receive these funds, uh, they will be lacking in receiving the dollars. Um, on the level they should. And so I appreciate Alderman Rhodey's leadership because he is really trying to get us to that point where we can bring these uh, things together and that we can be comprehensive in our understanding and how we also present the information to the public. So I don't want you to think we're beating up on you because it's not all your fault, okay? Not on any level is it all your fault. Uh, but one of the things I do want to do is uh, to save you some brief in the very near future. On uh, page 26, where you have the housing production accomplishments. Oh, wait a minute. 28, I'm sorry, 28. Um, go ahead and break that down. I know you're working on that long process, but go ahead and break this down to show us the affordable units. Right. We actually have that at the office. You got it. Yep. Good, yep. because they're going to look for it. They're going to ask for it. Yep, we have it. Okay, and we might as well uh, not give somebody an opportunity to have a, a news story that you're not trying to tell us that. I agree. Okay. I agree. That's it for me. Thank you, Alderman. Uh, Alderman Ogilvie. Uh, Alderman Boy. No. Alderman Oldenburg. One quick one, and I missed it because we were talking about leverage. Is there um, specificity around um, these CDA dollars, or these CDBG monies, um, help leverage X number of investment? I think you touched on it. I just don't know what slide it was. X number of investment in affordable housing. And is there specificity around uh, because of this gap financing, it produced X more numbers of affordable units? So HUD doesn't give us a match requirement, right. but we, we do, as a part of our um, application process, require that they leverage our dollars. And so um, we can provide that they, information. They, the developer? The developer, and then also yeah. on the nonprofit side, yeah. we also require that they. Because most of these, I would imagine, are all also federal uh, LIHTC 
developments as well. Yes. A good amount of them, yeah. right? In terms yep. of them, okay, okay. So they, they don't HUD doesn't require that you come that you produce any compliance report associated with um, leverage for home, or match. Home, we have a match report that we we do, um, but there's no specific like two for one match that we have to make sure with CPPG in particular. Gotcha. I gotcha. But we require it, and HUD requires it, just not a specific okay amount. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I think we've gone through everything, so I guess that takes us to the next step. Yes. So what, what's your preference? Uh, um, we actually have this? home repair next. Okay. So um, starting on page 29, 29 um, Melzinia Hill, who is, um, she works right under Bill Rata, will come up and uh, give you some information on home repair. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Give a little information on the Healthy Home Repair <clears throat> Program. Uh, centralized program began at Program Pro HUD model in 2014. Program partners are CDA, the Building Division, and Home Services. CDA has application processing, responsibility, oversight. The Building Division does inspection, lead testing, and monitoring. Home Services does contract, construction management and project management. HHRP accomplishments or Healthy Home pa Repair Program accomplishments. Uh, reduce the citywide waiting list by removing 10 years of backlog. Net reduction of over 2,000 from the citywide list. 326 applications have been sent out to date in 2017. In 2016, we closed 312 loans. 2018, loan closed, we're projected to close 336 loans. In 2016, $3.8 million in funds were committed. In 2017, we're on, uh, we're on track to commit $4.4 million in funding. 2017 accomplishment is projected 50% increase from the first year of centralization and over 100% increase from the last year of decentralization. HHRP accomplishment. Uh, loan commitments totaling 1.7 million issued to 109 homeowners. These are loan closings that are pending. People who will close probably within this year or next year. We've completed repairs to 115 homes. Homes construction and process are 97 homes and there are 252 projects under construction management which means that they're being um, soliciting for bids and doing 106 reviews. Minor home repair program. Uh, this program is limited to home, these programs are limited to homeowners age 62 and older who are low mod income, who are of low mod income. Mission St. Louis and, Mission St. Louis and um, housing, home services are a citywide program. The Urban League has a citywide program. North, New said, provides uh, home repair in six north side neighborhoods. They are Hamilton Heights, Jeff Vanderloo, Van der Vende neighborhood, Greater Ville, The Ville, and Wells Goodfellow. Harambe provides tuck pointing services in 24 north side neighborhoods. And CCBF, Carondelet Community Betterment Federation, provides uh, home repair in the Carondelet neighborhood. Uh, the down payment assistance program is administered through housing partnership. They assist low mod income, mostly first time home buyers, helping them to navigate the home buying process. They provide down payment and closing cost assistance. Clients have to receive counseling prior to receiving assistance and they are HUD certified housing counseling agency. Uh, thank you, do you have any questions? Alderman Kerry, any questions? No. Uh, no questions, Mr. Chairman, but uh, you did pronounce Harambe very well. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Alderman Boyd. Yes. Um, first of all, I want to say that I think 
CDA has done a phenomenal job with the whole waiting list process and all the restructuring. Um, because I remember when it was thousands of people on the waiting list and it's just, it was over 300 and something in the 22nd Ward alone. So I want to commend you guys for getting that list down. Um, I was wondering if you could provide um, us with a timeline from application to construction complete because it still seems like it takes a long, long time for people to actually, you know, have their services complete. So I'm, I'm su suggesting from, from application to inspection to contract selection to closing to construction completion. Is there any way we could have that information? Well, there's actually two tracks. When homeowners come in, if they have a priority situation or priority repair need, such as broken sewer line, broken water line, a leaky roof, um, or hazardous electrical situation, they get a priority application. And I would say the time from application to project's completion is about six months. And that's an emergency. We don't call them emergencies. Priority. The priority services. What's the difference? Well, the difference is emergency means immediate. Priority means, because we have a process. The process is because we are responsible, we have to get bids. Right. We can't just send someone out. We don't have contractors on staff who can just go out and do a project. There's actually a bidding process and an application qualification process. So they get a priority, they're, they're prioritized over people who would be in a comprehensive application process. No, no, I get that. I was just the semantics of priority versus emergency. Yes, sir. I didn't understand why there's, how there's a difference. So I would say in that case, probably from beginning to end, application to project completion is six months. Six months. Yes, sir. Um, and what's the, what's the bottleneck? Well, um, and, I would generally say there, there are a lot of people who are going through the process at the same time. Okay. Uh, the fact that we do have to solicit bids from contractors and we work with a finite number of contractors because we want to get the best pool possible. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't want to get into a situation where we got contractors who are not doing quality work. And also there's the issue of you have to manage them now. There's more management and oversight. Sure. So uh, that requires a lot more time. And home. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> And I would say another thing that sometimes slows the process up is we might get to closing and the homeowner decide that they're not sure that they want to actually close because um, they don't want a restriction on their their um, their deed, for example. So sometimes, I don't know, how. what's the longest you've seen with like a closing because a homeowner didn't want to close? It could be well, several months. We give them a period of time to get their information in. Or to you can step back to the mic. I'm sorry. We give them uh, 30 days to consider what they want to do if they you know if they still want to commit themselves uh, and then if they call up their unsure so we've had people who have come to the table and then decide at that time that they still are not willing to commit so we can extend it up to 60 days for them to consider what they if they want to commit the project and so someone has practically gone through the whole complete process selecting a contractor and then they get to close in they're not sure like, not sure how, 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 does, how often does that happen out of curiosity? Yeah. I would say it probably happens at least um, once or twice in a, in a cycle of us sending or us meeting, us sending out bids to people or, or sending out commitments. Give to me people. a percentage. Oh, of, 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 I'd say probably 10, 15 percent. Okay, well, I guess that's not too bad. Um, home services construction management. Tell, tell me about that again. Actually, what What's they do, that? they have oversights of the project. They solicit bids, uh, meet with contractors, uh, actually do the 106 reviews, uh, and also have loan closing responsibility. So they do most of the intake work? No, actually, uh, they not the application process. But what they would do is they would meet with the contractor, discuss the bids with them, um, review the bids, decide if it's, it's the most, if the cost, the work that they're gonna do is responsive to, um, I guess, the, the dollars that they're charging. They, they would also meet with the homeowner, talk about the quality of work, what work the contractor's going to do. Okay. And are they exclusive to this program or do they uh, do uh, have other clients? They're exclusive to this program. Okay. Oh. It's it still, I would like to get a timeline just to show, you know, mm -hmm. how long it typically takes and then, you know, pretty much what the average is. I, you guys seem to do pretty good with all these statistics and everything. So just kind of 
following the money to the end. I'd be curious to see, you know, how we how long move through that particular process. And I do know every now and then you have that one or two that just lingers on for one reason or another. Because I have Miss Colton in my neighborhood who gets sends me an email once a month, and we can't seem to get past it. But we'll talk about that later. Um, how about on? Let's see here. Downtown, down, Lord, not downtown, down payment assistance. So how, how much money is allocated and how many people have we served over, I guess, this 2014 through 2017 period out of curiosity? Uh, I know that it's, I can't give you, a, I'd have to get back with you on the number of people we provided assistance to on down payment, but it's normally $5,000. Um, I think 1500 goes to counseling and the additional funds goes to the, goes to the property owner for down payment and closing costs. Okay. And are we uh, partnering with people that are doing these new construction projects and helping make the transition to the new homes? With any of that going on? So with the uh, down payment assistance, um, we worked with Beyond Housing for a long time. Um, and during the 2014 to 2017 cycle, they decided last year that they didn't want to focus so much in the city any longer. They're focusing in the county. So last year, we didn't have any um, down payment assistance program in the city. This year, we're working with a new group called the Housing Partnership, who are certified housing counselors with HUD, have a lot of experience. So I'm hoping that their numbers will um, increase significantly. And I also hope that they will partner with organizations um, and those developers to try to get um, funding um, to the new homeowners. Okay, that's all I have. Thank you. And again, I just want to appreciate, you know, the good job I think you guys are doing managing the home repair process. Uh, Alderwoman Davis. Okay, I'll pick up on that because I, I was curious. I thought Better Family Life, I thought we were funding their uh, down payment assistance program. No, so I wonder who they're getting their money from. Federal Home Loan Bank? They probably are, yeah. Okay. And then um, you might want to check with Urban League because they're certified too with HUD on everything. Yeah. Um, but one of the things that I, when you do that um, analysis for the timeline, you're going to have to put a whole lot of asterisks there mm -hmm. because you've got people who come for assistance and they don't own the property, but they've been living in it because mama passed. 10 years ago, you got people who just simply can't navigate uh, and it takes a long time just to get, you know, and I don't know if you have the staff or the capacity, but I know when our nonprofit was doing it, we would have to do home visits and sit there and go through bags of stuff to find the paperwork that they needed. Uh, so I know that that's a lot of the time that's spent. And this is one of the programs that I don't believe we should be in the business of doing. And um, I don't know if that will ever change, but I just think that this is a program that we could actually turn all of it over to another agency to do. And because of modern technology, we can still monitor all the documentation process from afar, but not spend as much administrative time on. So I'm just throwing that out there. Probably never happened, but to me it makes more sense. So, uh, but I do commend you because I don't get the phone calls I used to get. I'm so happy, and I'm just so happy. You just don't know how happy I am. Uh, and people are getting served rather uh, fast. Uh, and when you put that infusion in there, I think that was two years ago, those extra dollars that we had left over and cleaned it all up. Oh my goodness, it was just wonderful, wonderful. So I thank you for that. Uh, but again, if I had my brothers, this is not the business that we would be in. I'm done. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Alderman Ogilvy. Um, thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, when, when people make an application into the Healthy Home Repair Program, mm -hmm. do we steer them towards the right program, or how do we differentiate between somebody who's going to get who's going to get home repair via mission or just through a regular um, well, CDA Healthy Home Repair Program. The Healthy Home Repair Program um, actually is statewide. 
So when people submit an application, they're only submitting it to one program, the Healthy Home Repair Program. Now the minor, that's that's different. It's certain neighborhoods, and we well, got the Urban League and the um, and Home Services provide a citywide program. But um, no, we're not steering them to either program. They actually call, I guess, word of mouth, or they get the information out there to community groups. They can actually be on multiple lists. Mm -hmm. um, so our, of course, we have a waiting list for healthy home repair. So if they have some work that one of the agencies, well, to the mic, it's sure kinda hard to um, they can actually be on a couple different lists. Um, and uh, so some of our healthy home repair work is pretty major. Um, and um, sometimes they want just minor home repairs. So they can be on our list waiting, you know, trying to get down the list and they can actually go to North Newstead, Urban League or um, Harambe even, for example, um, and get some work done in the meantime. Right, so that's my question. Do we do we tell them that or do they have to? Definitely. Uh, okay. Yes, sir. When they call our office, if they have a certain need, if we can't assist them at that time, if they're not a priority situation where we get an application out right away or a comprehensive one where they need a major repair but it's not a, it's not a health and safety, threat to health and safety, we put them on the waiting list. But if there are other services that they qualify for, definitely we refer them to other agencies as well as uh, some people may qualify if they live in a low mod census tract for um, low interest loans. So we give them as much information as possible when they call. Okay, thanks. Um, Alderman Boyd. No questions. And Alderman Oldenburg, no questions. Okay, Madam Director, where do we go to now? Now, if you'd like, we can go over the, the exhibit just so we can see the additional agencies that we're proposing. Okay, okay. So, on page 41, um, that's the exhibit, and these are the organizations that um, and entities that we're recommending for funding, um, starting with public service. We have, um, as Paul mentioned, um, Innovative Concept Academy, uh, Better Family Life, Big Brothers, Big Sisters, um, CCBF. We fund the Problem Property Team Program um, offered through the city. You'll see that listed. City Seniors um, and their work in vivo with the seniors. We have CHIPS who are funded for three different programs, one being um, their actual facility, their center, um, their health care beyond walls that takes their work on the road, and then their youth leadership development program. We have Covenant House, um, Criminal Justice Ministries, um, that's a release to rent reentry program. Of course, we still fund Expanded Recreation um, and Employment Connection. They have two activities, one being for just their Employment Connection activity, which would be for veterans um, and anyone looking for a job. And then you have the one that's specific to reentry services. We have Flance, Early Learning Center, Food Outreach, Gateway Greening. Guardian Angel Settlement, Settlement House has Child Care and Food Pantry. Of course, Herbert Hoover Boys and Girls Club that we funded for many, many years. Doorways for Emergency Housing, St. Louis Youth Jobs, and then um, Metro St. Louis Equal Housing and Opportunity Council. Um, their Fair Housing Education and Counseling Program. Um, let's see, North Newstead <clears throat> is funded for several activities. Um, they've been expanding their service area over the last year. And so um, their beautification program, elderly services, um, safety initiative um, are all funded in addition to minor home repair that's in the um, subsequent pages. We have Northside Youth and Senior Services Center, Prosperity Connection, Review West Florissant Development Corporation, Slate for their Rec to Tech program, Elderly Services, which is through the city's SLAY, Office of St. Louis Area Agency on Aging, St. Louis Artworks, um, SLACO for their Neighborhoods United for Change, and St. Louis Community College for their EMT program. <clears throat> on page 43, you have St. Louis Integrated Health Network, St. Louis Internship Program, St. Louis Public Schools, the Hope House, um, the Board for Inner City Missions, which is known as Neighborhood Houses, Tower Grove CDC for their Northside Southside Collaborative for Landlord Training, 
Urban League for their work with the black units, and then Wyman. Those are all of the public services. Any questions on any of those? All of you. 20 seconds. Oh, okay, sure, I do. Um, one of the things I learned from the process of restructuring since HUD came in was the mm -hmm. matrix system that was mm -hmm. created for the, the new scoring system mm -hmm. outside council, which I think is all very helpful. Mm -hmm. um, but what's very important to me is outcomes. Mm -hmm. And I, I know there are agencies out there that do good work, for example, Better Family Life <clears throat> and the Neighborhood Alliance. Mm -hmm. How are the outcomes measured with that program, if you're aware of off the top of your head? For particularly Better Family Life. Um, I'm gonna actually call Paul up, who's monitored them in prior years under Neighborhood Alliance. Okay. Um, because I think there's a little bit of information on that. Yeah, I'd, I'd be glad to. Uh, in 16, we basically monitored outreach of households, mm -hmm. and then they had target goals of uh, what they call assessments. So that's basically when um, a, a BFL staff person would meet with a client mm -hmm. um, you know, initially to kind of see what they need and follow-ups. Mm -hmm. So we had target numbers of I think it was like 750 people, and then each person was estimated to have like four or so assessments. And then our reimbursements tied to how many units of outreach they report each month, how many assessments they complete, and then they we would pay them based upon that. And so yeah, they, I don't remember the exact number, but they, they met all their goals. Okay. In, in and six, the other yeah, one is Herba Hoover Boys and Girls Club. Um, why are they getting funded? Uh, they have three different centers. Um, one's in Forest Park Southeast um, at Adams School, okay. the, the one on North Grand, and then um, the one in the Leo Fallon Reflex. And they basically offer after school programs and summer programs. Um, and they have a lot, a lot, a ton of kids. Um, I think it, after school's typically about 1,700 to 2,000, and summer program is about 1,000. And these kids are not membership kids, they're kids from the community. They are, they, 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 they do take membership kids and they have a sliding scale fee. I mean, let's take Adam School, for example. Are any kids paying for the after school programs? I think some of them do because they have a, because um, I was just looking at some else. They have a sliding scale fee. So there's basically, I mean, our funding subsidizes a lot of those kids. And we get reports about how many of the kids are low income, where the kids come from. Um, so we, we know that, yeah. And they, they do pay something. Um, some kids get it free. Some kids pay more. Um, but yeah, there's a. I don't know the details on the sliding scale. Okay, out of curiosity. So one, oh, go ahead. So one thing that we require um, and recently required over the last couple of years is that we will not reimburse any agency for any non-low mod individuals. So if they're not low mod, they're coming from com coming out of a different source. So okay. either it's sliding scale or it's a foundation grant they have through someone else. Out of curiosity, did the Monsanto YMCA apply at all this year? No. Okay. Um, the YMCA did apply, but I don't know if it was for Monsanto specifically. Okay. All right. Thank you. Appreciate it. It was not okay. He said it. I don't. I don't he said it was not for Monsanto. Okay, but in the in the past a, a year or two, they've applied, haven't they? Mm -mm. No, this is the first time we've seen them. Basically. Okay, they must have got funding from somewhere else. Okay. Thank you. Any other committee members with questions? Okay, so we completed the service section. Now the next category was? Um, uh, interim assistance, which is LRA that we talked about earlier. Um, and that's 1050000 Um Getting down to housing, um, we have the, the minor home repair program. So we have Crondelet Community Betterment Federation at 40000 Harambe Youth Training Pro Tr Training Corporation for their tuck pointing program at 100,000. Um, Mission St. Louis um, is, so home services merged with Mission. So Mission St. Louis is new to our Exhibit A, but they have all of the home services staff and um, capacity at their organization now. So Mission St. Louis will be handling the minor home repair, at least for this year, um, at 300,000. Um, and that's citywide. Um, North Newstead Minor Home Repair Program at 60000 um, The Housing Partnership for their Home Buyer Assistance Program with Down Payment Assistance at 100000 
and then the Urban League Minor Home Repair Program at 100,000. Um, and then basic home repair is included. Um, the building division handles our healthy home repair inspections. Um, as far as CDA, we handle um, the actual loan pool in addition to most of the intake for healthy home repair. And then Mission St. Louis um, slash Home Services does construction management for us, and we're proposing that again this year. For housing production, we're proposing 2.1 in CDBG and 1.786 in home for a total of $6,562,000 um, in housing-related services. Any questions on housing? I guess one quick one is, so I understand this correctly, the, uh, the, home, the home repair under the, uh, the one that totaled $1.9 million, $254,000 you're spending on building inspectors, and those inspectors go out and Make sure that the contractors have done the work the way that they should. Okay, and then the actual loan loans are 1.2 million. Is that right? It, it is. Like they were averaging about ten thousand dollars a loan. Roughly, roughly, depending on um, if you're using home funds, you have to actually bring the whole house to code, and that's why those run a little bit um, more pricey. Um, and then, in addition to what we have here listed in the exhibit, we do have some some money from prior years that will be dedicated for home repair again this year. So it'll be about $4 million roughly that we'll have for home repair. Okay, well that's kind of what I was curious about was the ratio of the inspection costs plus the healthy home repair, uh, the Mission St. Louis cost was about six, 700,000. Mm -hmm. So 700,000 out of 4 million I was just trying to figure out how much we're spending in overhead to actually, you know, increase the loan. Okay, thank you. Go ahead. Um, as far as housing production, um, we are proposing, and that's just the development of housing. Um, oh, I already discussed that, 3.8 um, million. Um, as far as economic development, we have um, the facade program at 700,000. Um, last year they were at 750. The year before that they were at about a million. They still have some money left over, so we're going to require that they spend that first before they spend a new allocation. The um, page you're on. I'm sorry, on page I'm now on 45. International the International Institute um, has a micro enterprise development program which we fund at 50,000. Um, Justine Peterson also has a micro enterprise technical assistance program that we fund at 100. And then um, St. Louis Local Development Corporation has um, a business development support program, which is, which is loans for businesses at 200,000. Um, anything on economic development? I'm sorry, yeah, loans, 200,000. What are the average size of those loans typically, those small business loans? In the past, they have not spent very much money um, out of CDBG because there are a lot of restrictions on job creation. Um, a lot of businesses can't guarantee even today that they can create jobs. And so in the past, they haven't spent very much, right. but we're hoping at some point they could uptick. Got it. But they have they have monies that are less restrictive, I'm assuming, where yes, they, they, they would rather draw from than yes. understood. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, for Gene Slay, their Dutchtown satellite, we have 450000 We're still paying on a Section 108 loan. Um, we're almost finished with that, about three years left, but that um, takes up about 1.5 million of our annual allocation. As far as CDA rehab admin, those are all of our staff members who are responsible for housing production and home repair. Um, and then getting down to admin, we have the city council's office who handles um, the legal work associated with CDBG, um, CDA admin. We fund federal grants who processes our bills and cuts our checks. Um, PDA administration, which is the planning department. SLDC, um, we handle um, some of the costs associated with the economic development piece. And then the capacity building for minority contractors at 70000 Any questions on that? Any questions? Alderman Kennedy. No question. 
Alder woman, uh, Alderman Boyd. The capacity building for minority contractors. Who's, who's doing that? It is St. Louis Development Corporation. St. Louis Development Corporation. And that used to be done by MoCan and, and um, Maybe 10 years, 10 years ago or so, MoCan. Then after that, it was um, MCI. Right. Um, and then now. So MCI didn't apply anymore? No. Okay. And do you know how many... Um, people were serving with that program? I don't. I can I can get the information for you. Mainly they use the funding for the plan room. Um, that's at Crossroads. And that's the plan room. We we always want to have a minority plan room where people can go and get technical assistance and that's most of that amount. And they get free copies of the plans? I do believe so. I believe okay, so. so there's no real technical assistance. No capacity that's building going on. Yeah, they, they had a... Um, and maybe Paul can come up again. They had a contract with an agency to do some technical assistance. Um, success, success metrics. metrics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think success metrics. And I, um, I get confused about the, the the topics, but they had basically different sessions. Um, and I think it was about twenty five to fifty people in those classes, um, and learning all everything from you know OSHA certification to you know how to replan to how to do budgeting. Um, and, and they had those kind of in, in different couple week sessions. SLDC. SLDC is a capacity building piece. So, so is, I can get that. I mean, is I there a calendar of like workshops throughout the year that they publish and small minority contractors can go there and, and, and make sure they take on these classes like budgeting and accessing capital and all that stuff? I don't, I mean, I, I know they recruit people but I don't know specifically where it goes but yeah we, I can I can yeah I would li really like because that's, that's one of those programs that just kind of flies under the radar but we keep talking about uh, capacity building for minority contractors we keep talking about you know getting m more minorities on these jobs and and so on and so forth but oftentimes they're underfunded our programs that we have and I'm not sure how much I'm really curious as to what they're doing for seventy thousand dollars, and if we're actually making an impact. Because no. um, what I don't want, I would hope, is not happening. If somebody's just sitting over there, and it's a secondary um, job that they have. If somebody happened to call, but they're not really program. running a program, you know. Because when I think about capacity building, and I used to be an executive director back in the '90s or so, I know what capacity building looks like. Uh, I know what the expectations from my point of view would be, and I'm curious as to what that program was. Matter of fact, would you send me a copy of the uh, application that they put in? Because it's a quasi city government, they don't have to apply, um, but we can be very involved in setting objectives for them. Right. So right now you're saying they just get this money, but there's no expectations. No, no. They, they have to have a contract with objectives, and that's what we work with them um, between now and the end of the year to come up with good objectives for the year. So if you'd like to give us some um, things that you'd like to see in it, we can definitely get that in there. Well, let me ask you this. Can you send me the one from last year? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. All righty. Thank you. Um, older woman Davis. So, Alderman Boyd, you, you hit one of those sore spots with me. I wasn't going to say anything, but since you started it. Capacity building for me means something very different from what has taken place in the past and what is currently being proposed. We have a lot of small business people out here who could do better if they have the access to opportunity. That's how you build capacity. That never comes from this entity. And so, we have had to go out and do it ourselves. Now, I'll give you a for instance. I don't particularly like to see people come into an area and make a lot of money in development and you're not building capacity. Right. We have a developer who has taken it upon himself to show us how to do it. And I'd like to see it duplicated. I'd like to see it assisted. He actually bought a building, housing a number of small 
minority businesses, giving them backroom assistance, including them in his development projects. For those who have capacity to get uh, larger projects, will assist in the bonding and those kinds of things. And actually, they're learning from a, a majority developer, and that's what they need. That's capacity building. Great. Not I can get some free drawings, and I can, and I may be able to go once or twice a year and sit in a session. Mm -hmm. That's not capacity building, and so we're going to have to do something much greater. Mm -hmm. And 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 um, seventy thousand dollars probably helps pay the rent, or and or a couple parts of some salaries but the actual work that needs to be done on the ground is not taking place. And I know because I'm out there talking to these people all the time. They don't even know when we have uh, opportunities for them to apply you know, for funding. They don't know how to do a lot of things, and that to me is capacity building. And so we've sat around with this for a moment, but uh, again, and that's not your fault, because that's not your task that task comes from someplace else, that we need to be putting this a program in place and are giving that opportunity to someone who's actually going to make a difference. This is not making a difference. And so I have a great concern about that. But again, I tend to go off in my little world and just make it happen. But uh, we're gonna have to uh, do something on a greater scale because people are tired of being left behind. They're tired of it. Right. And one thing um, I could I could ask Paul to do over the next week or so, because we'll be back in two weeks, is to work with um, Howard at SLDC to see if we can come up with something for next year that that would be more meaningful than just the plan room. I I appreciate that. Okay. I really do. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um. Are you finished? All, all of them, all of them, are you finished? Yes, sir. Oh. Uh. All of them. Ogilvy. Um, thanks. Can you tell me about this business development support program, what that is, where right. that happens, who administers right. that? It's, it's been around for many, many, many years. Um, it, is, it was administered by SLDC, but when the Economic Development Partnership um, was established, it moved out there through the St. Louis Local Development Corporation. Um, the program was active, really, really active for many, many years, um, but once um, the HUD compliance um, associated with job creation became more burdensome and then also because um, businesses weren't able to create jobs um, for a long period of time it became very difficult for them to find businesses that wanted the loan. So um, they're still actively um, marketing the program but they have some um, SBA money that's a little bit more attractive to businesses now and um, that's what they tend to use. So this, this 200000 is, is is paying people then no, it's direct loans to businesses. Oh, okay. mm -hmm. So it gives them the opportunity to have the loan available if a business um, wants it. So, for example, um, there was a grocery store in North City, was it Pete's? Safeway. Um, that there was a potential that it would close, um, but they came in with CDBG dollars to make sure that that business stayed open in North City. Okay. Okay, thanks. Uh, Alderwoman Boyd. I guess uh, my question is in regards to the facade piece, now I'm confused because uh, we are rebuilding our business association and they were told there was no money for facade program, one, and then two, they said that the uh, it has changed how you apply for the facade piece. And so I'm, I'm kind of like uh, Auto Woman Davis. When you keep them in the dark, they can't they can't produce because they don't know what the rules are, and so we're inviting SLDC, the Minority Business mm -hmm. Assistance. You know, we invite those people to those meetings, and they're giving them information that they don't know. So now I'm confused because they were told it was no dollars for facade, and now you're saying they have money they haven't even utilized. Yeah, I'm not sure. Um who's giving that message, but there is money available, and I need to work with them to see why they're saying that. And so, shut down all the time. 
<laughs> so have they <laughs> she doesn't like that <laughs> so have they changed the process on how people businesses can get the facade dollars? not necessarily one thing we promised um to Alderman Rohde and the mayor is that we would look at the facade program really closely between now and the end of the year and figure out where changes can be made because I think there are quite a few. Uh, maybe that's why they're saying that there's no money because we're looking at their process very, very closely to see, you know, are we getting the most bang for our buck? Are there easier ways to go about doing things and how we could make the, the bureaucracy less of a burden for the businesses? Right. Well, what I did suggest to SLDC, I did ask them to come to the meeting and talk to the businesses. And what I told Michelle, I said, I just really don't think it's fair to the businesses where people just, well, I say all the people just say, give them for side money. I said, you need to interact with these people to kind of know what they're doing <laughs> and see what role they're playing to support the community. I said, but if you don't know, you shouldn't just take my word for it. You should interact and learn those businesses. <laughs> so I think that's an issue that needs to be looked at okay. to make sure that she's knowledgeable of what these businesses are and what they're producing. <laughs> because I had businesses in my world that were nuisance and they were getting facade dollars. I'm like, how are they getting facade dollars and they're nuisance? So, you know, I would really like to see something more structured <laughs> to see how we can help those businesses, but also educate those businesses because they want to blossom in North St. Louis. Absolutely. And per perfect example, we had a young guy that has a business and he said, I know how to fix cars, but I don't know the first thing about keeping books. Mm -hmm. So we brought somebody in, the business assistance center to help him, you know, to get better so he can build his business. So I just think that's something we really need to look at. Yeah. We, uh, to follow up on that, Alderwoman, the, uh, the facade program, I, I've talked to a number of uh, older people about it. I think there's a, a fair amount of concern. Um, as an example, you know, there's been a, a great deal of discussion about how do we go ahead and spur development in other parts of the city. You, you, and uh, being an alderman in the central corridor who's you know been had a very active ward uh you know we take those concerns seriously uh we have used you know uh, not to, uh, we, there has been facades done in my ward as an example that i don't think those th 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 necessarily need them right and, right and so we are i think going through the process to try to figure out how to get you know, those resources deployed so that they're more concentrated in areas that they are needed. And one of the big concerns that I, has been a recurring uh, issue uh, uh, that I've been dealing with with other older people are, is the idea of planning and, and how do we go ahead and connect, um, you know, the facade program with planning with, um, you know, community organizing so that, uh, you know, the first step of planning is actually getting people in and, and developing a shared vision of what the neighborhood should be like or, or the business district should be like. So I think they're going through some process uh, to come up with something we kind of toyed around with a little bit before when we hired uh, Brian Robinson. Robinson. He has left the city and I think they're looking to get someone to replace him. But um, I think the thought is at some point the staff of this department or, or this program should be much more involved in community organizing and actually know the community a lot better right. and that would mean you know maybe taking them out of wards like mine that has a fair amount of infrastructure already in place and maybe deploying them to other areas of the city that that do not have that infrastructure, but I think they're trying to work through the logistics of that. I've been encouraging them to. And that's why I asked them to come to the meetings. I said, <laughs> you need to talk to them firsthand. Then that way, you won't go by my words. You'll know firsthand what's going on. Right. Yeah. I think having them, having managers, that's really commercial district managers, they should be out and right. talking to people. So right. that's going to be part of the analysis. If they aren't doing that, they should be. Okay. 
Okay, Alderman Oldenburg, you're the last on the list here. So. I don't have any questions. All right, thanks for coming. All right, well, uh, I think for, for uh, purposes of legal purposes, we had to have this uh, advertised and we had, was this the meeting that was advertised or? Didn't um, we have to advertise that we're having this meeting or? Um, no, other than the city process, no. We okay, will have well, a public well, we meeting. have officially had a hearing whether we had to advertise it or not. <laughs> Um, and we will be back in two weeks uh, with the intent of, of taking this up and passing it out at that point. If there are any concerns, could you work on them between now and then so that we can hit our deadline and not jeopardize our funding? Uh, and we may or may not be back on Wednesday to talk about the resolution, but if not, we would certainly hope to have that on the 18th. So if we're not back next Wednesday, we please kind of plan for a long meeting on the 18th because we'll have this, some zoning bills, and then the incentive resolution, so. And since we have two weeks between, if <clears throat> you guys need additional information or if you have questions in the meantime, feel free to shoot me an email or call and um, we will get those answered between now and then. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you all. Now, is that in addition to what we've already requested? Absolutely. Okay. We're gonna get that to you sooner than later. Well, let's consider this adjourned then. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.